I have to admit, I was starting to think you guys are kind of sadistic. You were really enjoying watching those kids cry. You were like, God, I gotta pray for you more. A lot, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, here's the deal. I don't act that way when little Debbie's run out. Only because, only because I'm old enough now to know they'll make more. I know where to get them. I know where to go to get them. Um, hey, I have really looked forward to being here. Uh, last week, um, my wife, some of you got a chance to hear my wife uh, share with you uh, a message, and you really enjoyed that, didn't you? You really enjoyed that. She's an incredible teacher. Um, I've learned a lot living with her for 32 years. Um, it's just been really cool. And then the guys, we had a great time up at the men's conference. We really did. And I hope you ladies notice a difference in, in some of your guys. Um, this morning, I've been sick the last couple days. Um, and so this morning, woke up, you know, with pink eye, terrible sore throat, heaving my guts out. But I feel better now. Don't touch me. That's right. That'd be a good thing. Don't touch me. Um, but I'm thinking, it's like I really want to be here, only because um, there's only 52 of these in a year. You know what I mean? There's only 52 Sundays in a year. And, and I'm anxious to be here. I really am. But also because I want to communicate an incredibly simple message with you this morning and then again next week. A two-part series talking about two of the greatest phrases you'll ever hear. Two of the greatest phrases you will ever hear. This morning, I want to share the first. I don't want to tell you what both of them are. I want to salt the oats a little bit and make you wonder what the second one is for next week. These two phrases are some of the most powerful forces known to man. They can encourage one to do what was thought impossible. They can lift one's spirit to the highest heights and motivate a person to become their very, very best. Far better and greater than what they ever, ever imagined, even in themselves. The first phrase is, I love you. It's the greatest phrase ever. I love you. Friends, I'm going to share just a simple message, and then I'm going to give an altar call at the end of the service this morning. For you to hear God tell you afresh, I love you. Love, what an incredible motivating force. It does incredible things when you think about it. What motivated God to make man? Love. What motivated God to make Eve? God's love for Adam. What motivated God to send his only begotten son to be killed and beaten for us? Love. What motivated Jesus to obey his heavenly father? Love. What motivates people to leave the comforts of home to go through a grueling itineration process to go to the mission field? What would motivate someone to do that? Love. Love is an incredibly motivating force. In fact, what motivates a man to say, will you marry me? It's love. Young ladies, if you've got a guy that's been dating you a while and he just can't get those words out of his mouth, I hate to break it to you, but he's just not that into you. Ooh. It got quiet in this place. If you got your Bibles, open with me. I'm going to begin with just taking a real quick look at this fun, motivating power between just this, this human love. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 18 and 19. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 18 and 19. Um, I, I love this stuff between, you know, man and woman, boy, girl stuff. I, I just love that kind of stuff. Um, I really like the woman's stuff more than the guy's stuff. I think the woman's got better stuff, personally. I mean, the guy's stuff, <laughs> keep it to yourself. <laughs> I mean, but the, the writer here, uh, Solomon, as he's writing, as he talks um, in, in 
the whole Proverbs 30, interesting stuff, uh, saying of Agar, uh, Agur, um, he talks about these different things that are interesting in life. And he comes to verse 18 and he says, there are three things that are too amazing for me, four that I do not understand. So he lists these four things, the way of an eagle in the sky. He says, there's just something about that. When you see it, it's just majestic. You, you can't comprehend it, what it does to you. It just, it moves something inside you. And all of us living here in Minnesota, we get the privilege of seeing eagles once in a while. And it's amazing, isn't it true? You've seen a bunch of them, but every time you see one, what's the first thing you do? There's an eagle. Like as if it's something that you've never seen before, because it's just incredible. There's something that, it moves something in you. Um, it goes on and says, uh, the, the way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake on a rock, same thing. You don't understand it, but there's something about a snake out sunning himself. Um, they're, they're cold-blooded creatures. They, they can't warm themselves up. They lay out on a rock, and I don't really understand the mystery at the same time, but every one of us will look, <laughs> mainly to see what direction he might be going, <laughs> but, we, but we, it's like this, it's kind of this mystery thing, you know? And this is the way of a ship on the high seas. Yeah, me too. I don't understand why those things can still float. And, and the seas, and they were, I mean, it's just an amazing. But then he gets to this last one that he says that I just don't understand. The way of a man with a maiden. Boy, isn't that true? The way of a man with a maiden. Man, when you see blossoming love, I mean, puberty is an amazing thing. I mean, literally, the week before girls got cooties, okay? Puberty kind of takes its effect, and it's like, oh, she's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. This, this idea of love, you know, this, this love, this, this way of a man uh, with a maiden, he does silly things. I mean, it's really, although we'll never admit it to you, but it's the love of a woman that a ca causes a young boy to take a shower without his parents prompting. <laughs> it's what prompts him to say, Mom, I need some deodorant. Why? Um, uh, he's thinking of her name, but he's not going to say that. He's like, well, because I've noticed I'm getting a little stinky. <laughs> a little? It's what motivates him to co start combing his hair. You know, when you notice, some of you moms, you've noticed this, when, you're, when your boys, oh, somebody must be interested, because he's leaving the house looking actually presentable. And it's kind of an amazing thing. I mean, he starts combing his hair for 20 minutes in front of the mirror. He brushes his teeth. He'll even wash the car. And you think it's because he loves you. No, Dad. He's hoping to be able to borrow it. My dad, you know, this, this idea of love, you've heard me share the story before because it's so true. Every one of us guys, we laugh. You ladies go, is that really true? Yes, it's true. You, there's that much power in this idea of, of love and this attraction. The way of a man with a maiden. We invite, you out, you out, I invite a date out for the movie. You get out to the movie, right? You're getting there and you're sitting there and you're, you know, it's like, wow. But you just don't know and you're hoping that somehow... Oh, ah, and you gently place it, not touching her yet, but it's back there. You're keyed, man. It's back there, and she didn't swat it away. So then you move it up, maybe just to touch her shoulder a little bit, and she doesn't flinch, and you're like, ooh, mama. <laughs> you're just cooking, man. You're, ooh, this is so good. Now, here's the thing you don't realize. Three minutes later, his arm went dead. <laughs> it is dead. He can't feel a thing. It's like, it's just there. But is he going to move it? Uh-uh. He is not going to move that thing for nothing. He's just like basking in the joy. It's like, ooh, baby. I mean, he, he just thinks he scored a touchdown. He thinks he went all the way. He thinks he's just got it all. Just right there. My dad would get on leave uh, out in Baltimore or out in the Boston area. I don't know exactly where he was stationed, but um, he would drive on the weekend 500 miles one way just to see my mom. Aww. Before they, you know, when they were dating, he's like, he was so enamored. He was in so much in love with this woman. 
He would drive 500 miles just to see her, only to spend just a few hours and then turn around and drive 500 miles back. It is just so cool. Um, I had the privilege of growing up and having that as an example uh, set before me. In fact, you know, my mom and dad were always kind of affectionate in a very healthy way um, around each other publicly. In fact, it was kind of embarrassing because whenever I had friends over, all I could think of is, Dad, please behave yourself. <laughs> because most people are not used to growing up in a home that was the kind of home I grew up in with a lot of love and a lot of affection and a lot of, you know, attention. People weren't used to that. They'd come over and all of a sudden, my mom would be coming tearing out of the kitchen through the living room running around. My dad's right behind her. All he wants is a kiss. My friends would look at me and say, your parents are weird. But you know, obviously I grew up to think that that's the greatest weird I could ever have. It really is. I was privileged enough to grow up in a home where that kind of love was shared not only with them, but also with us as children. And I realized that that's not normal. My kids have told me that many, many times as they've gotten older. The way that they grew up in a home, the same way. You know, get a room. <laughs> it's only breakfast time, get a room. <laughs> My kids had the privilege of growing up in a home like that as well. And again, I've heard them tell me many, many times that they grew up in a weird house but weird in such a nice way. Tragically, or unfortunately, many of you have grew up in a home where you never heard the strongest, most powerful phrase in the world, and that is that, I love you. For various reasons, maybe the death of a spouse or divorce. Sometimes your parents were dealing with their own issues, trying to raise kids, but their own issues were so overwhelming that they couldn't handle it. And you never heard those, those words, I love you. The greatest, most powerful words ever, words ever. The phrase, I love you. Tragically, if we grow up and we never heard those words, we're hungry to hear them. Because it's the most powerful phrase ever, it fills the greatest void in our life and the need to be loved. So what we do is we go out and we start looking for it in all the wrong places. And we settle to hear it from anybody who will say it. And tragically, oftentimes we experience in our life the hurts, the pains, the guilt, and the shame that comes along with that. But friends, if you've never heard a human say it, never heard your parents say it, I want to tell you about the greatest person to hear it from. And it's simple. Friends, I know this message is so simple. But you need to know, God says to you, I love you. He says, I love you. And we go, yeah, I know. No, no, you don't understand. I love you. Now, I know that you're hearing me right now for the, this morning for the first time, but, but, you know, I've been thinking about this message. It's been in, my, in me for a while. So for me, I'm just overwhelmed that I have a hanky close because I'm overwhelmed with God's love for you. It, it's incredible. It's hard to describe how much God loves you. In Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, I, I love this. Um, God is infatuated with you. You know what infatuation is, don't you? There's agape, there's that deep, serious, you know, love that it doesn't matter what you do in return, I just love you. Then there's this, this idea of infatuation. That's that silly love. It's a goofy love. It's what causes most teenage boys to get hurt. Because when a woman enters the, the presence, uh, the whole chemistry of that event changes, and he starts to show off. Injury is close to follow. Okay, because we just get goofy. We just get, you know, woo. Just this, this, you know something really amazing? Is God does that for us. It says in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, it says, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. God takes great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. 
God is crazy about you. Now, you probably didn't tune in this morning, but I heard him. He was singing over you. It sounded something like this. Tom, I love you. I love Tom so very much. I can't wait to see Tom. I love him. And I hope he knows how very much. Tom, I love you. I love you, Tom. Tom is so cool. I want to tell my angels. I want to tell all of creation about Tom. And then he started with you, and then you, and then you, and then you. He rejoices over you with singing. He fills the heavens with your name coming out of his voice. John 3.16, we all know it. The tragedy of knowing it so well is it has breeded familiarity. For God so loved the world. He so loved you that he gave his one and only son. His one and only. Here's the deal. You guys, if you come into my house and I have a pack of Oreos or a pack of Little Debbies, I will share. But if it's the last one, I don't think so. It ain't happening. That last one, that's mine. It's really funny. We have, right now, we have the, the privilege, actually, of having our youngest son and his uh, girlfriend. Um, in so many ways, there's, yeah. They're on their way. They're doing, they're doing really good. Um, we have the privilege of having them live with us. And, and, and I love Monster, the, the drink. And um, I love it, the green. The green's the only one. Amen? I mean, the green's the only one, the, the original, the green. The flavor is mm, intense. I, I just love it. And you know, I have, I'll have some around the house, and as long as I have a couple, if he takes one or whatever else, I know he'll replace it or he can take it and whatever. But if I only have one left, here's the thing, man, you've been busy. You, you count on it. You know it's there. You come home and you're like, I'm just looking forward to that monster. I want to come home and just kick back. I'm like, and you open the fridge. Ooh, this ain't good. <laughs> I've come close to nearly losing my salvation. <laughs> it's not good. I mean, you're telling me, it's like, it's the only one. I mean, friends, think about this. For God so loved you. He gave his one and only. He didn't have another. He gave his one and only son for you. That if you would believe in his name, that you would not perish, but you'd have everlasting life. In Romans 5, 8, he says, for God so demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, he died for us. He loves you. In Ephesians chapter 2, Verses 4 and 5, Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, it says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. By his great love. Chapter 3, verses 17, the second part of 17 through 19 it says, and I pray, the Apostle Paul writing says, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have the power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, how long, how high and deep is the love of Christ. I pray that you could just grasp it because you can't. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. 
Friends, most powerful phrase in the world, I love you. It motivates incredible stuff. I love you. God is crazy about you. This morning, in a few more minutes, I'm going to give you an invitation to come to an altar. I know that some of your backgrounds, that might, not, that might be so foreign, but in many of our evangelical churches, there's this idea that there's an altar here, and you come and you meet with God. In a fresh way, I'm going to give you an invitation to come and to hear the Lord tell you, I love you. You see, he's walking among us, and he's here. I, I love this. You know what's really interesting? He looks in you in your eyes. He looks in your eyes. You guys, don't get too ready. I got about 10 minutes left. Okay. Okay. He's just going to get ready, ready, but sometimes they don't know how to, I, I'm, I'm giving cues, but they're like, a, no, okay, is he, is he winding up or is he beginning to wind up? I'm only beginning. I love that, though, man. They're anxious. They're, I love that. Anxious to serve, anxious to see what God's going to do. Because, friends, this morning, I don't want to convince you. I want the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to minister to your heart. Imagine with me, Jesus, he looks in your eyes. He looks in your eyes, and he sees your hurt. He sees your doubt, and he says, I love you. In Luke chapter 22, verses 60 through 62, no doubt, Peter understood this. He just denied Jesus. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned straight at Peter. Peter remembered the word of the Lord spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. It's really funny. Because we look at Peter rather harshly at times, but you know something? Jesus looks at you. And he remembers the times that you too denied him. He sees your hurt. He sees your doubt. And he says, I love you. In John chapter 21, I'm glad it didn't end there. At the denial, you know the story. They go back on the beach. Jesus got a fire cooking there. There's some fish. He's cooking. Verse 15, it says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. <clears throat> Jesus said this to indicate what kind of death, what, what kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. I love this. And then he said to him, and I have to believe he looked him right in the eye. He said, follow me. I love you. Follow me. You know, Jesus looks in your eye. He looks at every one of us because none of us are perfect and we fall short. He knows all about your rejection. He knows all about your loneliness. There are nights when you have wondered, does anybody really care? When you were put to sleep only with your own tears and your own thoughts, I want to let you know something. Jesus says, I love you. In John chapter 9, verse 28, there was a man who was born blind and Jesus healed him and, and they brought him in. The Pharisees were investigating him. And in fact, in verse 24, it says, a second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know that this man's a sinner. I mean, they were harsh to this guy. They were mistreating this guy. Verse 28 says, then they hurled insults at him. They said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. 
They hurled insults at him. Where was this guy to go? I love it. Turn over to verse 35, and it says, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, so he went and looked for him. Friends, I want you to tell you something this morning. You've been carrying hurts that you wonder if Jesus even cares. I'll tell you something, he's looking for you this morning. He's looking for you. Because he wants to tell you he loves you. You know, he sees the abuse. He sees the bruises in your psyche. How people have said mean and hurtful words. He sees those things. And he wants to say, I love you. In John chapter 4, we see the story of the woman at the well. In verse 16, he told her, Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. (laughs) How many times we try to hide the truth from Jesus? I'm really okay, I'm not that bad, everything's good. Really, she's all alone, she's hurt. The abuse that she's put up with from a community who shunned her. Don't let her gather water with the other women of the city. The ridicule that she's had to put up with, the abuse. Her psyche has been damaged. And Jesus says, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you've had five. And the man that you have now is not your husband. What you've said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. How she must have felt at that very moment. Verse 25, the woman said, I know the Messiah, the Christ, is coming. And when he comes, he's going to explain everything to us. And Jesus declared, I am he who speaks to you. Can you imagine how she felt at that very moment? For him, he was saying, I love you. I who speak to you am he. I don't reject you. I don't cast you out. I love you. Oh, forgive me. Like I said, I've lived with this for a couple days now already. He knows all our failures. He knows the shame and the guilt that we carry. You should have known better. Because you truly should have. So the shame and the guilt that we carry. He knows all about it. And he says the most powerful phrase. He says, I love you. In John chapter 8, beginning at verse 2, it says, At dawn, he appeared and again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. He sat down to teach them. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. Look at this next phrase. They made her stand before the group. They intentionally forced her to bring shame and guilt. So many times when you and I sin, we fall short. We want to run and hide, but we feel forced in the light. And the guilt and the shame is overwhelming in his presence. They forced her. They forced her to stand before the group. And they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? You know the story. He begins to jot down right in the sand a few things. And they begin leaving, beginning with the eldest. Verse 9 At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up, and he asked her, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. 
neither do I condemn you. I love you. Friends, if we could just comprehend that God is crazy about you. He is crazy about you. He loves you. It's ourselves that we are so aware of, well, I'm not this and I'm not that, and all of God only knew. He knows. And you need to realize he loves you. He sees the brokenness of our lives. And it breaks his heart because he loves you. He says to, to you, he says, come to me. Come to me, will you? Would you please come? I knit you together in your mother's womb. I know all about you. I know what is on your mind before you even think it. I know what's going to come out of your mouth before you speak it. I know your thoughts when you rise and when you lay down. Where are you going to go from my presence? Should I go to the deepest darkness? No, it even turns light there. He says, I know everything about you. He says, and I love you. In 1 John 4, 16, it says, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. We know and rely on it because God is love. And then lastly, James 4, 8 says, come near to God and he will come near to you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Friends, this morning, I want to open up a time for you to be ministered to by the Lord himself. I want to give you an opportunity to respond. You know, there's, every one of us, we carry shame and guilt, hurt, brokenness, bruised psyches, hurtful words, even doubts if he loves us. Shame, ridicule, rejection. I want to ask you this morning to come, get up out of your chair in just a moment and come and just gather here. There's going to be too many of you to probably pray with everyone. I'm going to probably mingle my way through as much as I can and spread my germs all over you. Um, I don't intend to do that, but I'll be, I'll be careful. But I want you to respond because I do believe it, this message deserves a response. James 4, 8, it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. He says, come to me. So right now, as Pastor Bob begins to sing, would you just, just come forward, friends? Just come. Let's just stand at the altar. Let's spend a few times of letting God minister to us, to be ministered to, to hear afresh him say, I love you. Just to hear him say, I love you. Come. Let's just gather right here. Let's just reach out to his presence. Let's just reach out and say, God, I want to hear you say I love me. To hear you say that you love me. Come. You can stand. You can kneel. Just come. Friends, this isn't one of those, hey, you've got huge sin in your life, although we all do. This is, friends, come. If you need to hear afresh, for God to say to you, I love you. For you to hear him say, I'm crazy about you. I think you're the greatest thing that I ever made. When I was knitting you together in your mother's womb, I was so excited for you to know that all over again. Hallelujah. Praise God, oh Jesus. Heavenly Father, we need you. Father, this time of ministry, not just again to have a church service, just come in, hear some preaching and leave. Father, I pray that you would pour out your spirit on this place. Father, in a fresh way, Father, for us to hear you say, I love you, my son, I love you, my daughter. If you're here in this place and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, today would be a great day to say, Jesus, I believe you love me. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin, for I need you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh-huh.